I thought that went pretty good. It's been a couple of years, we haven't forgot how to do it. Um, before we get started in song, we're going to go to God in prayer. And the wonderful ladies at this church sent me your, this list, and, and I want to pray through this. And I thought about sometimes just saying, God, you know her name in this list, and he does. But I felt like I should be saying some names this morning. So let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Let's go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we pause this morning. It is just beautiful out, God. And we are thankful uh, to be able to get out of bed and come to church today and worship, worship you, Father. You are worth it. And uh, we thank you for that. I'm thankful that week I could be here with these good folks. Um, uh, what a blessing they are, Father. Thank you for taking care of us. Thank you that um, we're shaking hands and doing mutual greetings again in church. And that you sustained us through all the crazies of this world. You're awesome. You're a great provider, Father. Thank you for your son, Jesus. And God, we bring before you a lot. There's a lot of prayer requests on here. And you know every single name that's on here. Um, and you're more than able, Father, just to, to, to heal or comfort or do whatever you want to do, God. And we trust you with that. We, um, uh, we pray for Ron and Lorraine. Uh, as they celebrate 61 years of marriage, Father, thank you for that. We pray for Larry Tynstra. Um, I think he just had bypass surgery. Father, just ask that you knit all that stuff together perfectly and that he'd be healthy and strong in Jesus' name. Pray for Joe and Jen as they travel to Cyprus. Um, uh, pray for Joshua uh, as he adapts to life at Michigan Youth Challenge Academy. Father, may he... Um, May he have a huge blessing there, Father. May he encounter you in a new and rich way while he's at that place, Father, and ask that Steve Newland would bump into him there and it would work out perfectly, God. Um, uh, we pray for this church as they search for a shepherd, a pastor, Father. We ask you bring the right person to East Martin CRC and that it would be a mutual blessing, Father, and that person would love you with all their heart and serve you with all their heart and they would sh and he would shepherd these people and love these folks. Um, Oh, there's a lot of folks, Father, that have, uh, we live in a sinful world, in a fallen world, because of that we deal with cancer. And so there's a lot of folks, and we just ask you to be with Nora, and Reed, and Rena, Henry, and Dave, um, Lammers, and Joanna, and Owen, and Arlene, and Don, and Emily, and Nancy, and Randy. Um, just pray for healing, Father. Um, pray for peace and for comfort and strength for their families. Um, and we just pray for our troops and those who are struggling. Uh, pray for those who lost loved ones, Adrian's brother um, and Gord as he lost his brother. Pray for our missionaries. Um, and we pray for the shut-ins, Father, for Kathy and Mary, and just ask you to be with them. God, we pray for Rochelle as uh, she has a really, really big day coming up. And we just ask, God, you'd bless her. And uh, as, as people go to the polls, Father, we ask that um, you would spur people on to get involved and be active and to vote for people that love and serve you first, Father. If, if our leaders would love and serve you first, we would, it, as all this would go, all the problems would be fixed. So we pray for godly leadership. Thank you for your son. It's his name we pray with the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, song 762, and I have no idea what L-U-Y-H stands for. Okay, that's what it stands for. Perfect. You might want to shut this off while I sing, or it could be dicey.
The call to worship is uh, from Psalms 9. Oh, no. It is from, well, I think it's from, well, it's, the call to worship is this. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Um, God's word is a light unto our feet and a lamp unto our path. And let's sing song 667, and that is from the Celebration Hymnal. Is that correct? And then we'll sing 414 from the Celebration Hymnal as well.
Well, I already did prayer, prayer concerns and prayer requests. I did that earlier in the opening prayer. And then I think I did the congregational prayer too. So we're just checking these all off the list. <laughs> um, let's do an offering. How about that? If the deacons would rise and you do an offering, that'd be great. Thank you for the special music. Uh, before I get started, I do want to pray again. So let's, let's pray. Bow our heads, please. Heavenly Father, thank you. Um, thank you for this time again, God, and uh, the resources that you provide um, uh, for this church, for your bride. Uh, we appreciate those. Uh, Father, we're here to look into your word, and we ask that you'd speak to these dear folks, and it would not be my ideas or opinions or thoughts. Father, if it is, it's a waste of time, but I am, I'm here as an empty vessel, God, asking that you would use me um, to encourage and challenge and um, to be a blessing to his people. Father, we need your word, and we need you every single day. So be in this place, Father. Be with us. We love you so much. We praise in Christ, name, and the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I'm going to be reading from Matthew chapter 4. It'll be 1 through 11. Give you a second to turn to that. Matthew chapter 4, starting in verse 1. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city, and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written, 
He will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. Jesus answered him, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and all their splendor. All this I will give to you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, away from me, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him and angels came and attended him. And the title of today's message is Knowing God's Word. When, when I took a class on expository preaching, expository preaching is looking at a text and how, and how the text speaks to us. You, you look at context. And so we have our text, which is the main body, Matthew 4, 1 through 11. But you look at what surrounds that. What, uh, what precedes Matthew 4, 11? Well, what precedes it is Matthew 3. And this is where John the Baptist prepares the way for Jesus. Remember, Jesus is walking up to the Jordan, and John says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of man. And John baptizes Jesus in the Jordan, and heaven is torn open, and the Spirit descends on him like a dove. It's this, it's this powerful, really awesome thing that happens. And right following that is the temptation of Jesus. And so often I see... So often I see in people's lives these mountaintop experiences, and then the tempter comes. It's crazy. The first time someone joins counsel, it's like the enemy attacks them. Or there's a retreat at youth camp, and, 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 and kids give their life to Jesus Christ, and they come back, and it's like the enemy's after them. Um. You know, people that didn't grow up in church are born again and baptized, and the enemy is after them. And so it's this, it's this picture right here where there's this awesome, amazing thing happened, and then here, and here comes the devil. And so a little side note is, if you decide to join council, or if you do go on a retreat, or if, if you're going on a missions trip, and you go to the Philippines, and you share Christ with people, and it's this you're closest to God is off the charts and you're seeing lives changed. When you come back, be prepared. Be prepared because the enemy comes. But that's the context here. And that's, but that's not, that's a whole nother message for another Sunday if I ever get invited back, which Vegas size are 50-50. Today's message is what to do when the enemy comes when the enemy tempts, when the enemy lies, when the enemy attacks, what do we do? How do we do it? Well, we have our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that gives us the playbook for what to do, verbatim, how to handle it. And guess what? We're all attacked and tormented by our enemy and his minions. It's, it's, life is a battle every single day, but the Bible says it's not against flesh and blood. We're not fighting against people. It's a spiritual battle. It's a spiritual battle. Now, the enemy uses people and orchestrates people, but it's a spiritual battle. And so how do we fight a spiritual battle? Well, what does Jesus do? Let's take a look. Jesus was hungry. Now, look, he is God, but he's also man. And if you don't eat for 40 days, you're hungry. And that's your flesh. And our flesh, being hungry is not bad. Look at me, I've eaten a lot of stuff. But our flesh is not spiritual. This is not going to inherit the kingdom of heaven right here. And when our flesh cries out for food or all the things that your body wants, it cries out for it. When you fast, when you, when you, if, if we're going to, if we're going to go into fasting for some specific reason, when you fast, you deny your flesh, you deny your body food. And you do that because you take authority over it, that the spirit is in charge here. Not what, you, not your, not my flesh, not my body, not what my body craves. That's not in charge. The spirit is. And so Jesus was hungry. 
And the devil tempts him to satisfy his flesh. Is it a sin for Jesus to turn stones into bread? It's not a sin for Jesus to turn stones into bread. But the devil tempts him with satisfying the flesh. And he, and he tempts us with satisfying the flesh. Eating food is not wrong, but it tempts us to overindulge. Jesus turned water into wine. He, he drank wine with his 12 disciples the night before, before he was betrayed. Having wine is not bad, but having two bottles of wine is overindulging. Your flesh says, that glass of wine was good. How about a bottle of wine? Or your flesh says, that piece of cake was good. How about three more? That's your flesh. And so he tempts Jesus to satisfy his flesh. And what does our Savior do when he's tempted to satisfy the flesh? He said, man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. The next time the enemy says to me, you know, Dave, that glass of wine was good. How about five more? I probably should say, man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Or, or pick a carnal temptation that we have. Overindulging in whatever it is that is not beneficial, that's not honoring God. Whatever that is for you, Christ gives us the word to defeat that. The devil says, well, that one didn't work, so let's try this one. Let's try this one. Throw yourself down from this temple. And the Bible says, the devil says this, the Bible quotes, the devil quotes the Bible. He will command his angels concerning you that they will lift you up in their hands so you'll not strike your foot against a stone. That is Psalm 91 11. Psalm 91 11 in the Old Testament. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. The devil is quoting scripture. That's interesting, isn't it? I promise you, I promise you, I promise you, our enemy knows this. He knows what's in here. You go, how can that be? He's evil. He is. It's a purest form of evil. He's, pri he's prideful. He wants to be God. He knows what's in here. And that's because he's our enemy, and he wants to trip us up, and he wants to mess us up. So he, he can't convince Jesus to fall and give into his flesh and overindulge, so he tries a Bible verse. He tries a Bible verse. And we go, how is that possible? Because he's a liar. And if he's going to twist things, if he's going to twist things, he better know what it says in here. And Jesus says to him, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. See, the devil used Scripture out of context inappropriately. And Jesus used Scripture in context appropriately. How often do we have people say, well, the Bible says that love covers over, over a multitude of sins. So if there's love involved, it's got to be good, right? Well, not always. Not always. The world will take pieces and parts of this, use it out of context and inappropriately for their agenda. And it's not God-honoring, and it's not biblical. So Jesus uses Scripture in the proper context in a God-honoring way and smashes on the enemy again. So the next time you turn on the news or at a conversation with someone, and they're saying something that you know is not right, but they're somehow twisting in Scripture, you know what to say and how to say it. You could justify any bad habit you wanted by twisting some Bible verse. It's ha it happens all the time. But Christ shows us to use Scripture properly so you can correctly handle the word of truth. So the devil says, well, that didn't work. So he takes Jesus to a high mountain and he shows 
all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he says to them, all this I will give you if you will bow down and worship me. I think it's a third temptation because it's probably the hardest temptation. The pursuit of power, the pursuit of, pers- of, po- of possession, all this I will give, the world is mine, is a, is a, is a very worldly, popular saying. And the devil offers that to Jesus. And he offers it to people in this mirage. If you have enough money, enough stuff, enough women, enough popularity, enough likes, enough follows, a big enough social platform, all this I will give you if you bow down and worship me. And what does Christ say? Away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. When he said this, the devil left him and the angels came and attended him. These three temptations are commonly referred to in the the Bible as the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. Those, Those are common threads to everyday temptation, big and small, that we face every day, you guys. And our our teacher, our guide, our Savior shows us that he quotes Scripture properly. He didn't argue with them. He didn't arm wrestle them. He quotes Scripture to the devil. And that is a way for us to defend ourselves. That being said... It's probably harder today than it has ever been in the history of our country to spend time in God's Word. I don't know if I'm getting older and life's getting faster or what, but when I grew up, I didn't have a cell phone. The the computer that was in the school was the size of that organ. It's huge. It took 45 minutes to reboot. Everybody's got an iPad, an iPhone, a T... We hope that our kids would watch TV. I remember growing up as a kid and say, shut that TV off and get outside. Now you hope your kids would watch TV. Like, is there something on Discovery Channel about lions chasing gazelles? Would you please shut the phone off? Would you please shut your iPad off? We have so much stuff to do. You know that these phones have a tracker on how much time you spend on them? The amount of hours that we involve on a phone. Now look, I sell chemicals for a living. And so the things that I can get done with a phone, with Excel documents and PDFs and emailing and texting and sending stuff is I'm about 150 times more efficient than I ever was. But there's also temptation to look at the news. FYI, don't do that. Or to get on social media and find out what your friends from high school, you know, how many kids they have and where they live. And we spend time doing things. And look, some of those things aren't bad. Some of those things aren't bad. Hobbies are not bad. But we're busy. When I was a kid, there was only Little League. There was no travel anything sports. And look, I'm not knocking travel sports, but there was no travel sports. You played Little League, and that was it. And you played games twice a night, and then you you played 12 games, and you called it good. There's travel For every sport you can play, hockey, baseball, soccer, pick one. There's travel sports or everything. And and if you're in travel sports, this is I'm not condemning anyone. But I remember someone asking, I have four kids, two boys and two girls, and they're athletes, and they're asked to do travel sports. And I said, well, what's the schedule like? Well, we leave for Ohio on Thursday night, and we play games on Friday and games on Saturday and games on Sunday. You come home Sunday night. We do that for four months. Right. I said, when do you go to church and have dinner with your family after church? Well, you know, it's, it's, it's really busy. And so we're busy and we're tired. And so there's no mistake that everything out there is fighting for your time, but to carve out 15 minutes a day to sit down and say, God, I want to, I want to know what you have to say to me. Father, it's just 
I just want to sit at your feet. I want to be taught by you. I want to open this up and I want to eat it. And I want to get inside of my body. Jeremiah said, your words came and I ate them. They were my joy and my heart's delight. Jesus said to the, to the disciples and to a bunch of people, unless you eat my flesh, you have no part with me. And it was very hard for people to understand, but he wasn't talking about his physical muscle. He was talking about he's the living word. We need to consume him. I want you to, to, to wake up in the morning and at your dinner table to sit before this like it's a filet wrapped in bacon with mashed potatoes and gravy and green beans smothered in butter and go, this is delicious. I'm going to eat this. I want this inside of me. I don't want you to open this up and go, I got to do my devotions today. I'm going to hurry up and rush through this so I can get to work. I got to do my devotions today because that bald guy with a goatee who looks like a psychopath told me I should. I want you to open it up and go, this is amazing. This is alive. It's the only book, it's the only words that are alive. It's the only book, it's the only words that can change your life and your eternal address. This is the only book and the only words that you can use to defend yourself against the enemy, and he's running rampant. And, and FYI, folks, it's going to get worse. Ah, things will get better, you know, the be an election this November and we'll get things and it'll be a, no it's going to get worse because you know why because the Bible says it's going to get worse to cherish this and look I know I got four kids I work a lot I'm busy too but to just pause and, and, and read and eat this is, is there's so much in here that's so powerful and light-changing from from Genesis to Revelation all of it is good If we don't spend time in it, how will we know how to defend ourselves? When the enemy comes and twists a scripture. Top seven quoted Bible verses that are not Bible verses. You ready? God helps those who help themselves. That is nowhere in here. We probably, some of us have probably said it. If you do, don't feel embarrassed. I've had a lot of people that grew up in Christian homes, went to church, went to Christian, graduated from Christian high with a better GPA than I did, who've quoted, God helps those who help themselves. That's not scripture. That's not in the Bible. It's not in here. The author that put this list together, it was actually really good, said, if I could pick one phrase to erase from the memories of every Christian, it would be this one. This falsely remembered Bible verse, which is not a Bible, is blatantly contradictory to every scripture actually teaches us. Where does the phrase come from? It comes from a proverbial statement from the ancient Greek tragedies, the Quran 1311, or something similar. An English politician gave us this exact wording with Benjamin Franklin quotes in Poor Richard's Almanac. The message of Romans 5 8 is the exact opposite. While we are still sinners and unable to to help ourselves, Christ died for us, providing, proving how much God loves us, how amazing his grace is, and how uh, incapable we are, we are of helping ourselves. God helps those who help themselves is not a Bible verse. God won't give you more than you can handle. That's not in the Bible. And it's not biblical. In fact, oftentimes God gives you more than you can handle. Why? So you rely on him. God, I can't do this. God, I can't, I can't handle this. I have no idea what to do, Father. I am relying on you. So not only does this not a Bible verse, but it's, it's opposite of what we should do. Cleanliness is next to godliness. Now look, I'm Dutch. A lot of Dutch folks in here, maybe all Dutch folks in here, and Dutch folks, especially Dutch ladies, are excellent at cleaning. Now, I've heard this verse. And look, I don't even mind if you say this. You can say cleanliness is next to godliness. Because look, if you read the Old Testament, it is full of all sorts of laws about cleaning things and how we take care of things. And look, in addition to that, God is organized. I used to be disorganized when I was younger. We had a pandemic, and I went to my pole barn, and all I did was listen to Christian music 
and clean my pole barn and something happened to me and I got organized, which is a curse because when people are unorganized in your house, it drives you crazy. So I wish I was unorganized. But anyway, organization is biblical. You know why? Because God is organized. Read the Old Testament, how he details the temple. Look at a hummingbird. See an ocean. See a fish in the ocean. Look at a Drake Mallard's feathers. Our God is organized and detailed, and it is tight and right. So it's biblical. But cleanliness is, is, uh, cleanliness is next to godliness is not in the Bible. So you can say it to your kids, but you can't say it's a verse in the Bible. Money is the root of all evil. Now listen to this one. Christianity and money seems to be at odds with each other. After all, Jesus says it's impossible to serve God and money. Matthew 6, 24. And pastors who preach the evils of money will point to this verse from the New Testament. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. The eagle-eyed reader will notice a key difference in the original statement. Money is a root of all evil. And the scripture references the, the writer in 1 Timothy doesn't make money the root of all evil. Rather, the love of money is a root of all evil. Why is this difference important? Because money in itself is neutral. Money is neutral, neither good nor evil. The author uses the word philagoria, which is a Greek word, which means extreme greediness. Extreme greediness, the root of all evil. But extreme greediness causes a person, a church, a company to harm others in a quest for more. So, Money is not the root of all evil. The love of money is the root of all evil. God may bless you with tremendous resources. By the way, you own nothing. You are simply a temporary manager of what God gives you. You can't take any of it with you, I promise. And if God gives you tremendous resources to manage, he can do great things through you with those resources. And we will give an account of our management someday when we stand before him. But money is not the root of all evil. The love of money is the root of all evil. That word is a big difference in there. To thine own self be true. It's funny how any quote in, in the Elizabethan uh, English can be attributed to the Bible, like the King James Version. You put thine in something, and all of a sudden it's in the Bible. Thine is, any phrase with thine in it must be in the King James Bible. This is from Shakespeare's Hamlet, To Thine Own Self Be True. That is not in the Bible. That's not a scripture. This too shall pass. Wisdomness 411. <laughs> this, that's not in the Bible. And whenever something bad happens, this verse pops up. It certainly sounds biblical, and some have even quoted it on TV as being from God's word, but it's not. And it's not even necessarily true. Sure, will usually move beyond debilitating issues. Things can pass. Pain, you can get over pain. You can get over loss. You can find another job. You can recover from an accident. But not every pain will pass away while on this earth. In fact, some pains don't pass away because God has bigger purposes for them. We can be sure that God provides comfort, but that doesn't mean he'll necessarily take away the source of our pain. Paul had a thorn in his flesh. He kept praying to God to take that thorn away, but God said, my power is made perfect in your weakness. And he kept Paul humble. And the last one, number seven, because seven is a number in the Bible that is completeness. Ye verily, God wants you to be happy. That's Oprah 1.1. This popular verse floats around to the top every so often and gets thrown around on talk shows and magazines. We like to think that our happiness is God's highest goal because that fits our consumer-focused, instant access, you-deserve-it world. It's a verse that allows people to skirt other biblical mandates because, as it often claimed, happiness trumps everything else. But no, but none of these false verses does more damage than this one. We are here to praise God, 
not to accumulate wealth, be comfortable, have a great relationship, feel satisfied, or reach our personal goals. In fact, if we put our happiness ahead of everything else, we are completely disobeying what Jesus said are the most important commands, love God and love people. And some of these sayings sound really catchy and really nice and even sound like they're in the Bible, but they're not. And why, is, why did I read those? Why did I cover that? Because we have to know what God's word says. Words matter. Do you remember what happened to Eve and Adam in the Garden of Eden when they fell? When sin entered humanity? Do you know what the devil said in the form of a serpent, which was a very wise, looked at as a wise animal back then? It's no, he didn't take the form of a donkey, what do you think is stupid? He took the form of a serpent. That was not a mistake. And he said to Eve, while Adam was standing right there, he said, did God really say? That's what he said. Did, the question was, did God really say? It's right here. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat from the fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. Did God say you couldn't touch it? He never said that. He said you can't eat it. So here eat, the devil sees a crack in the armor. She misquoted God's word. Now, if you remember, God told Adam the rules. Adam's job was to tell his wife the rules, and Adam fumbled at the five-yard line, and now Eve's sitting with the devil, and the devil's going, did God really say? And Eve's like, yeah. He said, he said you, you can't eat the tree in the middle of the garden of knowledge of good and evil, or you'll die, and you can't touch it. And he, he probably slithered it over to her hand, and she touches it, and she's holding it, which is not sin. It's not sin. God didn't say don't touch it. He said don't eat it. Don't eat it. And so she's holding this fruit in her hand, and she goes, I'm not dead. And her mind starts to go, well, if I'm not dead now, and the devil says I'm not going to die, and the devil says you'll be like God if you eat that fruit. And she took and she ate it, and she gave it to her husband who was standing there with her, which means right next to her. He was not off hoeing and pulling weeds, or there was no weeds yet, but it soon to be weeds. He went working. He went over there working. He's standing right there going, Happy wife, happy life. I'll take some too. Little bitty words. And we fell. And humanity fell. And I'm not going to throw stones at Adam and Eve because I've fallen. We've, we're all fallen people. But my challenge to us today is to have mastery of this. Is to have mastery of this. When the world comes to you and say, I mean, let's be honest with each other. The Senate of the, of the CRC is talking about, did God really say that homosexuality is a sin? They're arguing about it right now. Right? This is not some far-off debate in San Francisco, you guys. This is the CRC discussing if uh, two men that are married can be pastors. Did God really say that homosexuality is, isn't love? Doesn't that cover all sins? I was on a council, and, I, and, I, and one of the council members was talking about Calvin College and a professor that said, Genesis is poetry, and that evolution is how we came to be. Did God really say that he created the world, that he formed it from nothing? I mean, evolution, may, I mean, that's an explanation, and I'm a scientist, and, and, and I'm, a, I'm a PhD professor. He has students sitting in his classroom. He's teaching them that evolution, that we evolved. If you look at the Catholic Church, it allows for evolutionist beliefs. And I'm going to tell you right now, it's, if you read this cover to cover, Genesis and the account of creation is beautiful, but it's woven through the entire scripture. Read Job, Job 39. When Job, 30, when Job 39, God talks to Job and said, where were you when I formed the deep springs? Where were you when I wove together the Leviathan? 
So if you don't believe in creation, then you can throw the whole thing out. You can't just rip out Genesis and go, ah, it was poetry. It's not literal. We came from blah, 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 and some stuff smashed together in the universe 50 billion years ago, and all of a sudden you got Apple phones, right? If you don't believe in creation, then you don't believe in this. That's a fact. Now, look, there's small E evolution, right? We don't have neon colored moths stuck to trees because all the ones that were real bright colored got eaten by owls and the ones that were brown had babies and reproduced. That's not, we came from monkeys. But there's, there's belief in Calvin College, conservative Christian college, where people are saying, did God really create the universe? And we think these arguments are far off. They're right next door, you guys. They're right next door. Ephesians 6, 10 through 20 is the full armor of God. And that scripture talks about the spiritual battle that I've been talking about here, where the enemy comes and lies, and where Jesus tells us to use his word. And that scripture is, finally be strong in the Lord and his mighty power, put in the full armor of God so you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of the dark world, and against the spiritual force of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, from the full armor of God so you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Put on the whole armor of God so you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Uh, put on the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the helmet of salvation, the shield of faith so you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one, and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Of all those items that you put on, one is offensive. One is offensive. All the rest are defensive. A helmet to protect your head, a breastplate of the righteous to protect your heart, a belt of truth to gird your loins, to shoot the rest of the gospel of peace for your feet so you don't step on stuff. There's one weapon that is offensive that you can fight with. And what does that Bible verse say? The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. This is our sword right here. This is how we fight the enemy, the spiritual battle right here. It's the only thing that's offensive, that we can speak, that we can say, that we can quote when we're tempted, that we're in a tough situation, that when we're sitting with somebody who's, who's, who's family is, is, is dealing with a death or a loss or they're going through cancer, this is what we fight with right here, the sword of the Spirit. My question is, is do you have a Nerf sword? Or do you have a saber that's razor sharp that'll cut, I mean, cut through anything? And that's up to you. Nerf swords are nice. They're cute. I know John 3.16. Right? Everyone knows John 3.16. But do we know that thing? Do we know this? Are we wielding a sword that the devil comes by and we pull that sword out and he goes, whoa. She knows what she's talking about. Wow. He really has been in that thing. I coach football at Camels United, Camels of Christian. And we have drills we do every practice called everyday drills, EDDs, everyday drills. And you don't only do them every single day, because the same drill every single day, because we want to get really, really good at them, really good at them. And if you get in this every single day, you're going to get really, really good with it, really good with it. I brought, um, I brought a 52-week Bible reading sheet with me, and there's uh, printed unchecked copies in the back. At the back, in the narthex, and the shelf back there, I printed 50. If you're the last one to grab one, please make copies. But I printed this, and, and when I was a born-again Christian, I wanted to read the Bible cover to cover. I was convicted about it. I need to read from Genesis through Revelation, the whole thing cover to cover. I wanted to. I felt like I needed to do that. And I started in Genesis, and I went through Exodus. It was really, I mean, awesome, you know, people leaving Egypt. Um, and I got to Leviticus. There's a lot of laws in there, a lot of laws in Leviticus. And you get to Numbers, and then you get genealogy. And you start reading Hezekiah's and Huzakai's and Wetzakai's, and it's like, who got be, begot who, be, begot who, begot who, begot who. And it's like my brain would, like, seize up. And, and look. There's a purpose that God put that in his word. He's very organized. He, all these genealogies from, uh, from, from Adam to, to Abraham, from Abraham to David, from David to Jesus. It's awesome that it's all in there. And I love all of it. 
But if you start in Genesis, you just read straight through the Old Testament, it can be tough. It can be tough. So this Bible reading, you guys, Sundays are the epistles, the letters. Awesome. And it's, it's not a real long day. This morning was 2 Corinthians 4 through 5. And then Monday is the law. And that starts from Genesis, and it goes all the way through Deuteronomy. And then Tuesday is history, Joshua, and all the judges, and the kings. And then Wednesday is Psalms. Wednesday is a short, a short read. Thursday is poetry. That's also a short day. It goes from Job all the way through um, Song of Solomon. Friday is uh, prophecy, and that one can be a longer day too, Isaiah and Jeremiah. Um, and then Saturday is the Gospels. And I started doing this, and it was fantastic. And all I did was wait. I prefer to do it in the morning. I, I, however people want to do it, they want to do it before they go to bed. That's their business. I like to start my day off on the right foot, so I try to do it in the morning. And look, I'm not going to lie to you. I told you. I have four kids. I work a lot, and I'm busy. So if, I don't, if I'm rushing out the door because I'm late, I grab this. I pull up Bible Gateway. I plug in uh, 2 Corinthians 4 through 5. I hook it to my truck. And when I drive to Grand Rapids, I play 2 Corinthians 4 through 5, and I, that word gets into me. Now, I think it's better to read it. I do. I just, for whatever reason, I think it's better to read it. I get more out of it reading it and having quiet time. But if you're busy and you play it in your car or you've got to do something, you play it on your, on your iPhone, BibleGateway.com will play that scripture for you. And you just go through this every single day and you don't miss. And if you miss a day, don't feel condemned. Just make it up that night or make it up the next day. I've, been, I've, I've had to travel and all of a sudden you go, oh, I didn't, get, I didn't get my Friday done because I was traveling. And so you do Friday and Saturday together. If you do this Bible reading sheet here and you go through and you read what it says or listen to it and check it, when you get done, you've read through the Bible cover to cover. And this is very palatable, delicious, bite-sized pieces. And it's awesome. And I started doing that 19 years ago. I think this is my 19th year of doing this. And I'm Dutch, so what I do is I get through checking one side, and I just pull it back up and start checking the other side. Then I check the middle, and I'd, have, I'd, have, I'd go to a, a meeting with some of my buddies from Youth of Christ, and I pull my Bible out, and I set my sheet aside, and it was tattered and old, and there was, it had been checked on three times, like, hey, Z, I could print you another one of those if you want. It's like, well, just keep using it. It still works. And all of a sudden, you read through the Bible cover to cover, and you do it 19 times, and people start saying stuff. And you go, no, no, that's not right. Or people, or you got a word for someone because they're, they need encouragement. The most important thing in this life is your relationship with Jesus Christ. Number one, you get that right, you win. Spending time with him and his word is absolutely critical. It's more important than your job. It's more important than other relationships. It's more important than how your grass looks. I can guarantee you that. You can mow that stuff later, get in that word and eat and enjoy it. Be encouraged in that. I'm going to tell you folks right now, as the day, as the battle rages on, we're going to really need to know what this says. I'm going to tell you that right now. You're going to really need to know what that says. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for this time. God, thank you for being in this place. God, you have preserved for us your word. From creation until now, we have an account of everything you need us to know and do. And God, there has been countries and there have been leaders and there has been times when the devil tried to destroy your word. And you have preserved it for us today. It's been translated into all these different languages, Father, from original Hebrew and Greek texts. You did that for us so that we don't have to have questions and guess. We can just open up your word. God, we thank you that you guide us with it. We thank you as you love us so much that you preserved it for us. Father, may it be inside of us and may it ooze out of us at work, at home, in our social circles, and whatever we do, God, may your word flow out of us and may it be sweet to other people 
and may they be encouraged to open up themselves. Thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, your living word that you sent to us. It's in his name we pray by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, our closing song will be on the screen too. Okay. Six, five, eight is our closing song. Is there? Sorry. Five, six, eight. Did I say that right? I want to see one. Okay. I, we're going to sing that one. 766. We'll sing that one. We do, the, we do the blessing in the last song, right? Perfect. Okay, I'll read the doxology from Jude. It's, uh, it's, it's my favorite one. To him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ, our Lord, before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you.